Hey, everyone, welcome back. As, as we continue our story through Acts, I want to spend some time today with Saul, who, of course, later becomes known as Paul. Today, I want to focus on the beginning of his story, and then we're going to loop back around to that which happens hereafter as we conclude our series on Friday. But to start, I want you to think back to the stoning of Stephen from our reflections on Friday. You may remember the mention of a young man watching over the event and giving approval to the crowd's deathly persecution of Stephen. That man was Saul. Now, as you will find, Saul and then Paul much monopolizes much of the remainder of the books, book of Acts, not to mention a good portion of the New Testament as a whole, but that's the portion of the story we're going to come back to on Friday. For today, I want to talk about that moment of his conversion in chapter 9. This all takes place right on the heels of the, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch that we read about yesterday. And it says that, meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, I want to pause here for a second because this is a small but important detail to the story, especially for when we come back to it on Friday. Saul isn't just some hired hand out doing his job of trying to sub subdue the outbreak of this group of carpet carpenter-inspired rebel rousers. Saul isn't given a charge that he's just dutifully carrying out. No, Saul is the motivating force here. His animus towards the followers of the way is so vitriolic. His conviction to preserve the traditions so deep that he goes seeking the authority to hunt down these cancerous believers and snuff them out once and for all. Okay, continuing on with the story, we're told that as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly... A light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though, though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Okay, second pause here. First, I think it's somewhat humorous to consider the manner in which these stories are so often written in that matter-of-fact kind of way. A man walking down the street was knocked to the ground, overcome by the voice of Jesus, and blinded by the light of, the all, of it all. But the telling of the story is so simple and straightforward that I honestly think we can miss out on the stunning nature of that moment. More importantly, however, I... I think this notion of being blinded is worth our consideration. We're going to swing back around to this at the end of the story, but as we read through the rest of this, I want you to just hang on to that image of this grand, authoritative, and powerful figure of Saul being struck down from his place of esteem as he, blindly, as he is blindly led by the hand into that which comes next. Now the rest of the story. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. 
The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke his name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food... He regained his sight. Now, as I mentioned before, that which follows for Saul will be the focus of our reflections on Friday. But for today, I'm drawn into that period of blindness that was set upon Saul on the road to Damascus. Why? Why was he blinded? Was it meant to humble him? Was it intended to humiliate him? It Was it to teach him a lesson? I found myself asking that question and in so in doing so, thinking back to so many of our reflections in recent weeks. Yesterday's notion of being open to what God is doing in the moment. Sunday's concept of shifting our gaze to the hope of Christ. Our reflections on finding God in these turbulent times. The consideration of seeking God's will above our own. I could go on and on with these, but, but what struck me as I considered this imposed blindness upon Saul was the fact that beneath so many of these notions that we've considered in this series is that fundamental need to shift our sights from our vision of the world to God. Or, if I can say it another way, to be blinded from the manner in which we view the world so that we might be able to see that which God longs for us to see. See, I think it did teach him a lesson, and it most certainly would have humbled Saul, but but I think there's a more fundamental lesson in the blindness that was struck upon him. I think it's important to note that it wasn't until Saul was blinded from that rage and animus that drove him that he was able to find that new perspective. I think Saul was blinded because he had to be pulled away from the manner in which he was seeing this world before he would be able to see the same through God's eyes. And while perhaps not in the same physical way, of course, I, I do wonder if that same need is true for us more often than we might realize. For so many of the things we've considered in these weeks, it actually starts with this. It starts with shutting our eyes to the manner in which we, can, we see this world around us. So that we might discover more clearly the view that God inspires within us. What struck me is that Paul needed to be struck blind before he could see anew. 
think for so much of what we've talked about in many ways, the same is true for us. Let's join in prayer together. God of love, your view of this world, of, of each of us, it's like nothing we could ever dream or imagine. We long, God, for just a glimpse of the beauty of that vision. Help us to set aside our perspectives, our baggage, the myriad of things that hinder our sights, and grant us the blessing of your Spirit, that we might find just that glimpse of the wonder through which you see this world around us, and the love through which you see each and every one of us in it. For we pray it in his name. Amen. As always, my thanks for you taking the time to be with me. A blessed afternoon, and I will see you tomorrow.